My name is Connie Gabe. Uh, we uh, hope that uh, our forums educate and inspire you to garden and appreciate the beautiful gardens and green spaces in Iowa City. We're always welcoming new volunteers, experienced gardeners, or novices. And we have a sign-up sheet at the front desk uh, if, uh, if you'd like to join our group. We'd love to have you. Uh, I want to thank our partners, uh, our partner, uh, Iowa City Public Library and Beth Fisher and her staff for hosting our forums year after year. Uh, the program can be viewed on the library's YouTube channel and is available for checkout. Through the years, our nonprofit organization has funded over two million in projects, including the public garden at the city-owned Ned Ashton House on Park Road and Terry Trueblood Recreational Area. Our all-volunteer effort has grown to include planting and maintaining parks, roadsides, riverfront, medians, parkways, and public school grounds. In 2020, we celebrate our 52nd anniversary of service to the community. Your financial contributions are greatly appreciated and, be, and may be made online or at the Project Green website or the Community Foundation of Johnson County or via the City of Iowa City. And I wanted to uh, share some up upcoming events that we have with you. Obviously, the, the next two uh, forums, uh, the next one on February, Sunday, February 9th, um, at our second garden forum, we'll be showing a film about the gardens of Pete uh, Udolph. Our Q&A portion will be hosted by Tyler Baird, the Assistant Superintendent of Parks, and, uh, Parks for the city who is a fan of Udolph's uh, design aesthetic. So that, I think that will be very interesting. I've heard really great things about the film. <clears throat> On Sunday, March 8th, Adam Janke will be presenting Making Landscapes Work for Wildlife. If that sounds familiar, it was because he was on our program last year and got snowed in in Ames. So everybody hope for a little better outcome this March. Um, and in July of 2020, we will be repeating our Open Gardens Weekend, which had its inaugural last year. We had 30 gardens and an estimated 600 visitors who appreciated the variety of gardens and the opportunity to speak with the, the homeowners and the home gardeners. Um, thanks to our generous business sponsors, we did not have to uh, charge an admission fee. And this year's event is scheduled for June 27th and 28th getting confirmation from anybody there. I think those are the dates. Uh, but look for it in our newsletter and our, um, on our website. Now, to today's speaker. Um, our speaker today is Kristen Morrow. Uh, she's a Johnson County Conservation Naturalist. Kristen will focus on the vital role that native plants play in the landscape, particularly for pollinators. Kristen is an Iowa native from St. Ansgar in north central Iowa. I looked it up, it's a town of about a thousand, I think, and uh, a lot of those towns in Iowa, uh, and grew up exploring the banks of the Cedar River. Uh, after graduating from Iowa State in the environmental sciences, she worked as a guide and naturalist in New Mexico, uh, in watershed restoration in Idaho, and in Iowa for the Nature Conservancy before joining Johnson County. Uh, but uh, wait, there's more. Following Kristen, um, Fred Meyer of Iowa's, uh, Iowa City's Backyard Abundance is going to provide some information on a few events that his organization is uh, sponsoring this season. And Fred, as well as Kristen, have provided a lot of handouts and there's some seeds that Kristen has bought, uh, brought uh, that you can help yourself to during the break. And I would ask that um, Kristen will be presenting for about <clears throat> 50 minutes to an hour. And as usual, we'll break after that for cookies and coffee. And that, we ask that you go around that way for the cookies and coffee. We're in a little smaller venue than we usually are. So um, <clears throat> we're a little more crowded, but going around that way. And after the break, we'll have the Q&A. And after the Q&A, we'll have Fred come up and, and address the group. Um, we have a sign up, or excuse me, we have a sheet up here on the clipboard. Uh, if questions occur to you, um, please at break, go ahead and, <clears throat> excuse me, write the questions on the, on the pages up there. It makes it easier to get everything recorded. 
if we can ask the questions up here. Um, so now, please uh, join me in welcoming Kristen Mara. I'll just talk uh, closer to this microphone. You should be okay now. Okay, I'm good. Uh, so before I get into today's topic, I just want to give an overview to Johnson County conservation overall. And I'm seeing some shaking heads like there's people not hearing me still. Okay, let's see. Can you turn up my volume a little bit? How's this? No? Still not great, I hear. It always happens at one time or another. <laughs> Usually the first program of the year. Test. Testing. Testing. One, two, three. Have a mic. I'll just clip it to your shirt somewhere. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Fabulous. So I'll give a quick rundown to Johnson County Conservation. By show of hands, does anyone feel pretty familiar with the work that Johnson County Conservation does? Okay. I'm seeing just about half of the hands here, so a uh, good thing to go over. First of all, we are a part of the county government, and we have our separate governing board, and we have a threefold mission. So Johnson County works to buy, protect, and restore natural spaces across the county, and we've actually got 18 different properties that span from 1,000-acre properties like F.W. Kent Park uh, to several hundred-acre properties like Cedar River Crossing and Peckman Creek Delta and then down to much smaller spaces like campgrounds, roadside parks, and trail corridors. So the other part of our mission, or the second part of our mission, is to provide places for people to get out and actually enjoy the outdoors. So we want people to be able to camp, hike, fish, hunt, go bird watching uh, as much as possible so that they actually care about preserving these spaces. And then finally, uh, the third part of our mission is to provide educational opportunities, any chance to learn about the outdoors, and that's where my role as a naturalist comes in. So all year round, even on cold days like today, I'm usually outside and teaching people of all ages. So a lot of people think that we do a lot of work with uh, elementary students on field trips, and that is true, but we teach to any group that comes out. So we have a lot of senior groups, a lot of uh, college groups, high school, uh, you name it. We're always eager to get people outside and learning. Uh, and our education also spans the whole gamut of outdoor ed. Uh, we are sometimes teaching about backpacking, about map and compass use, how to start a fire with flint and steel. Uh, but we also uh, do a lot of education about our native Iowa ecosystems. So usually you'll find me out in a tall grass prairie or uh, wading through a wetland with uh, a group looking for little creatures uh, in our oak savannas. And so this topic of native plants is one that I'm extremely passionate about and just really excited to be sharing this with you guys today. I do have some copies of our latest newsletter uh, over here. And in this, you'll find some of the latest projects that Johnson County Conservation is working on, as well as some topics that are pertinent to, to today's topic of native plants. And then in the back, we actually have a whole slew of educational programs that continue on into March. So make sure that you grab one of these. If we run out, there's a whole bunch more that are just in the library lobby. Okay, so I'll dive into my topic today then. Uh, native plants, the building blocks for a healthy planet. As a professional conservationist, uh, it's my job to stay well informed about a lot of the environmental issues that we all face as a society. And so I'm often reading about some pretty challenging things. I'm reading about the implications of climate change with the fires in Australia or uh, about water quality in Iowa and how it's affecting things like freshwater mussels or uh, just the various pollutants that we have. 
Uh, I'm reading about the news that I'm sure a lot of you saw this past fall, where we had uh, headline news of bird populations plummeting across North America. Three billion birds no longer in our populations. So as you can imagine, after a while, this kind of news starts to really wear you down. It can be pretty overwhelming, exhausting. Uh, it makes me feel as one small person, like I'm not always sure how to play a role and make a positive impact. And that's why this topic is one that I think is super inspiring and hopefully empowering to each of you. I really like this quote by Douglas Tallamy. Has anyone heard of Douglas Tallamy in here? All right, good to see. So Tallamy is a entomologist, so someone who studies insects. And he's become a national leader in the topic of native plants and backyard conservation. And so he says, worried about the planet, change starts in your backyard. And I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think that the impact that we can all make by the plants that we choose to put there actually is a really big positive step that can be empowering in times of uh, otherwise overwhelming news. So specifically today, I'll just give an overview to native plants, why they matter. I'll go through a plant, um, well, several plants, uh, give a profile of them, and then some resources to get you started in native plant gardening. So first of all, what a native plant is. It might not seem like something that you actually need to define, but as I was putting this presentation together, I did find some varying definitions. So my implied definition is this one here. A plant that has evolved in a space with a long enough time to develop complex relationships with the ecosystem around it. And the relationships is really the key part of that definition. For instance, Iowa's landscape has changed a lot over its history, over hundreds of thousands and millions of years. Its climate has changed a lot. So a plant that was native here 100,000 years ago or even 20,000 years ago probably isn't relevant to today's landscape. So we want to be thinking about those relationships. And we also want to be zooming in as close as possible. So starting within the confines of Johnson County, and then maybe to southeast Iowa, <laughs> Iowa overall, and then maybe stepping back to native plants to the Midwest. And this is an important thing to bring up because wildflowers are growing in popularity today. You can pretty easily find seed packets uh, online that describe themselves as North American native flowers. That might include native flowers in California or Florida, and flowers that to us in Iowa don't have any relationships. So really zoom in. And then along with that, uh, think about where your seed source is coming from, because you could have a plant that's native to both Iowa and Florida, but if that seed is being grown in Florida and shipped over here, the genes that it's coming from might not be well adapted to the conditions that we have here in our state. So think as locally as you can, and also think about what kinds of relationships it has with the things around it. So why are they so important? You know, uh, I, I've always believed or I've been told that native plants are something that we should be advocating for and pushing out into the community. But it wasn't until recent years that I actually understood just how significant of a role they play. And it all actually comes down to those relationships, thinking about the food systems and the food chains that they belong to. So to get at that, we're going to review some pretty basic elementary science here. Of course, we've got all of this great energy that's coming down from the sun. And plants are the only creatures that are able to take all of that energy and convert it into a usable form that all of us higher beings in the food chain can then utilize. But plants don't necessarily want to get eaten. If they were delicious and digestible by everything, any creature that wants to eat it, then they would get overeaten, there'd be nothing left, just little stubs, and they wouldn't be able to pass on their genes and reproduce. So plants have developed all of these different strategies, all these defenses to keep them from getting overeaten. Some things that might readily come to mind are things like sharp thorns, maybe leaves that are really uh, sandpapery and coarse. We've got a lot of those in the tall grass prairie. Uh, maybe stinky parts of their overall growth. But a defense that we don't see and so don't readily think about is the fact that all of these plants have evolved to have different leaf chemistries. 
And those different chemical makeups actually make them undigestible to most of the things that would want to eat them. Now, thankfully, plants aren't evolving in a vacuum, obviously. And all the other things that are evolving with them are trying to develop strategies to get at those resources. And most important in terms of tapping into the energy that the plants are creating and then passing it on are insect herbivores, so the, the insects that are relying on the plant tissues as their food source. Of those insect herbivores, about 10% are considered generalists. And so that means that they are able to eat pretty much any kind of leaf out there. They are able to digest the chemicals that are found across a wide, wide variety of different plants. But most of them, 90%, are specialists. And so they can only eat uh, maybe one type of plant, or they can only eat a certain lineage, or even a handful of lineages. But they can't eat everything. So we're all probably familiar with some examples of these. There's one really well-known one. Can anyone think of a well-known specialist that we talk about a lot these days? Oh, well, I heard actually a lot of different things there. <laughs> so good, a lot of examples. Uh, monarch. monarch butterflies is the one that I'm thinking of especially. Right, so we all know that if we find a little monarch caterpillar and let's say a little kid brings it in to raise and tries to feed it blades of grass or leaves of dandelions, that caterpillar is going to shrivel up and starve to death. It absolutely needs to have milkweed plants in order to develop and become an adult. Now, monarchs aren't the exception. There's nothing special about them. Well, they're cool, but there's nothing special in that regard. Monarchs are the norm. They are just one species that has this devoted relationship with a single plant. And that is the norm across all of these different, 90% of these different insects out there. So let's look at an example here. We've got this wildflower, uh, native to Iowa, wild bergamot. And here are just four different species that use wild bergamot as its host. So we've got the gray marble moth, the raspberry pyrosta moth, which I think is super cool, the orange mint moth, and the hermit sphinx moth. I'm sure all of those are ones that none of us have ever thought about before. I certainly hadn't thought about them before looking into this a little bit more. So if we have wild bergamot in our backyards, then we're able to maybe go out and find more of these other creatures. Likewise, if we don't have wild bergamot abundant across the state, we would have less of these four different creatures across the state as well. Now, it doesn't stop there. Of course, this is a food chain, a complex food web. So all of these creatures have so many different lines going off of them too. Those creatures are feeding the predaceous insects and the spiders, the frogs, the fish. And especially if we take all of these creatures as ambassadors for all of the, the insects that have these specialized relationships, especially we can tie their health straight to the health of our songbird populations. So across North America, adult songbirds have a variety in their diet. They're able to eat nuts, berries, seeds, insects. But the vast majority of them, in fact, 96% of them, are relying entirely on insects to feed their babies. They only feed their babies insects. And of those, they're mostly utilizing the caterpillars of moths and butterflies. So how many caterpillars do you think we're talking here? Let's say I've got uh, a chickadee here. How many caterpillars do you think it would take for a single nest to develop all of those little babies to develop into adults. Any ideas? Oh, three to five thousand. Three to five thousand is actually a low number. Maybe a smaller, a smaller bird. The research that I read, and this is also coming from Douglas Tallamy, is that a single clutch of chickadees requires between six and ten thousand caterpillars. And chickadees are a pretty small bird overall. So think about your own yard and whether or not your yard currently is able to support six to 10,000 caterpillars. <laughs> and if we want more than one clutch of chickadees, or if we want the nests of five different species or bigger songbirds like blue jays or cardinals, are we able to support 20 and 30 and 40,000 caterpillars? In essence, the more diverse and complex and sticking to our native plants that we have in our backyards, 
the richer our ecosystems will be and the more songbirds we'll be able to enjoy as we wake up each day. So we know then that these, uh, these caterpillars need to have specialized foods, but do any of our non-native plants feed them too? Thinking of the generalists, all those generalist insect herbivores, sure, they can probably eat a lot of different uh, non-native plants that we have. But far and away, the answer to this is no. The non-native plants that most of us currently have in our backyards are not really feeding the insect herbivores that we have. So I've got a few examples to share with you guys. And the first one uh, regards some trees. So this is a tree that I have in my yard. And I like this tree. This is a ginkgo tree. It's got really cool leaves. I love the way that the leaves hang off of the branches. And its evolutionary history is pretty cool. Uh, this tree is the oldest species on Earth. But I also really get annoyed by this tree. It creates the stinkiest berries that make my yard smell like vomit. And they're really hard for me to rake up. And they don't just go away because there's no native wildlife that want to eat these berries. So ginkgo trees are, of course, non-native to the US. They used to live here uh, hundreds of millions of years ago. But they also went extinct here millions of years ago, too. So today, there is a whopping one recorded species of Lepidopteran, so a one recorded moth or butterfly species that is known to eat the leaves of this tree. So instead, and I should say that I currently rent my house, otherwise I would probably uh, make some changes. <laughs> instead, if I had, say, a native oak like this red oak here, any idea, any guesses how many species I would be feeding? Some good guesses, 10 to 20. There are a recorded 534 species of moth and butterflies that are known currently to use oaks as their host plant. So this ginkgo tree isn't necessarily doing any harm, but it is taking valuable space in my yard that could be filled with a species that is contributing much greater levels to the ecosystem in my neighborhood. And I should point out real quick that as I'm talking about these different host plants, I am, anytime you see a number, it's referring to a Lepidopteran species, a moth or butterfly species. And that is because that's where most of the research has currently been done. So moths and butterflies are the sexy insects, the ones that are charismatic and that we've been putting a lot of our resources to study. So we don't really have numbers yet for all of the other less glamorous parts of the insect world. So who knows how much those numbers would change as we continue to delve into this, this topic. There are exceptions to this. I've got an exception right up here. So does anyone recognize the caterpillar that we have? Right, we've got a black swallowtail. They, of course, use as their host plant species in the carrot family. And they will happily munch away on a native flower like golden alexander that we have in the tall grass prairie. But they'll also happily munch away on non-natives like dill and parsley, even noxious invasives like wild parsnip. So in this case, the leaf chemistries of both the native and non-native species are similar enough that they're able to utilize either. They are one of the exceptions, and there are more than one exceptions. But if we look at the hundreds of thousands of different insect species that exist, this isn't a very common thing. One more example for you guys, again going back to trees. So we've got two that look a lot, they look very similar to each other. They even have maple in the name of both. So we've got the non-native Norway maple, and then any example of a native maple, like the sugar maple here. And their leaves even look very similar. But non-native Norway maple was brought here in the 1750s. And even though it's been here for about 250 years, today there has not been a single species that's been recorded to use the leaves of this tree. Versus maples as a whole, any clump of native maple species feeds 285 different species of moths or butterflies. Well, unfortunately, Norway maples are actually the most sold shade tree in the United States. And even worse, they've actually become an invasive species in other parts of the country. So they are outcompeting the things that are feeding our native insects. Well, I really like this Talamy quote as well. A plant that has fed nothing has not done its job. 
So I think this is a really big paradigm shift that we all need to be making. You know, we see a lot of plants that are being sold that, um, that have as a prized characteristic something being pest free, right? This doesn't get eaten by insects, but think about that. That means that we are putting something, we are sterilizing this environment with things that cannot feed the other parts of our ecosystem. So instead, going forward, I'd love to see this big shift where we're looking for the plants that will feed the most. How can we draw as many of our native pollinators, our native insects, and give them a buffet in our backyards? And that brings me just to some plant profiles here. I'll go through some flowers, some shrubs, and some trees. And with these, I'll highlight some of the relationships that exist for them. Uh, these are not things that you need to memorize, of course, <laughs> and you don't need to plant these species. But I hope that this will reinforce the idea that every native plant that we choose to plant has its own host of relationships that we're able to create or to foster. So with our spring, or with our wildflowers, uh, I'm going through kind of a calendar year here. So two great options for the earliest part of the spring, uh, blooming in mid-April into mid-May, are violets and pussy toes. Now violets are great because a lot of us already have them growing, mingled in our yard. I'm always astounded when people want to rid the yards of violets because to me it's just two or three of the prettiest weeks of the year when I have this blanket of purple. Even better, violets are the main food source for any fritillary butterfly. And so I have here three different kinds. Uh, this is the most common, the great spangled fritillary, the variegated fritillary, and the regal fritillary. And the regal fritillary is actually Iowa's state butterfly, but one that you are unlikely to find today. Its populations are so low that it is very rare to come across them. They all use violets, and it could be the common violets that we have in our yards, or more uh, rare violets that we'd find in a high quality habitat. So right off the bat there, we've got a super easy way that we can help boost their populations. We'll foster violets that grow there currently or even start spreading them into our, our turf grass mix to, to let them develop. Uh, you could also plant pussy toes and you might find some more American lady butterflies that use pussy toes as their host. And both of these are also able then to provide nectar and pollen to those first emerging bees in a time when other food sources can be a little bit more scarce. So pushing on later into the summer, around June into July, you could have milkweed, butterfly milkweed here, and purple prairie clover. So I'm sure that a lot of us are already planting milkweed to provide food for monarchs, but you may not know that they actually have so many different relationships tied to them. So here are just a handful. We've got milkweed bugs, and they'll eat the, the seeds of milkweeds later in the season. Uh, the milkweed tussock moth. Has anyone found these on milkweeds in your backyard? All right, good to see. Sometimes they're considered a pest because they, unlike monarchs, they'll be laid in mass and they'll develop in mass, so you'll have your plant just crawling with tons and tons of caterpillars. They'll actually be one of those that do eat the plant down to just the stem and leave nothing behind. But they're cool in their own right, and they're a native insect. The unexpected cystinia moth, I'm blanking on this one, I think it's a, some kind of striped garden moth. And then the longhorn milkweed beetle. Another cool thing, just an aside here, is that the creatures that use uh, milkweed as part of their host. Do you recognize or see any commonality between them? Yeah, they all got this bright color and this one has a larva and the larval form also has a bright color. I just think that's kind of neat that they show the oranges, the yellows, the reds that may signal to other things that they've been eating this plant that has something that is toxic to most other things. So purple prairie clover, uh, another great one. I always try to seek this out in the tall grass prairie while it's in bloom. And any time that I'm able to find it, it's pretty short. It grows to be about two feet tall. So it's hard to find sometimes. But when I do find it, it is just covered in bees. They really love this. It'll definitely be a magnet in your yard. You also might find more, the yellow one is the southern dog face butterfly, the Reichardt's blue, and the eastern tailed butterfly that all use that as a host. Moving on into Late July, getting into August, you could provide Joe Pieweed, uh, Rattlesnake Master, which is probably my favorite Iowa wildflower. 
Joe pieweed gets to be about four to six feet tall, and anytime I find it, it always has a butterfly on it. It's also a host to these three really cool moths. There's the ruby tiger moth, which looks like it has that great red boa around its neck. The three-striped garden moth and the climbing moth. And all of these, I think, are ones that we should appreciate. One, because they inherently are uh, worthy of our appreciation, but they look so cool. I want to see more of them out on the landscape. And then Rattlesnake Master, like I said, I love it. Uh, whenever I find it in bloom, it kind of makes the air around it smell like a, a mild honey-sweetened tea. And also, it's a host to the rattlesnake borer moth, which utilizes the roots of this plant for parts of its life cycle. Another great thing about Rattlesnake Master, its stems are a little bit more hollow, and they're also really tough and fibrous. And so they take a long time to break down. So things like cavity nesting bees, that could be a great resource for them to burrow in and find a great protective home. Two more uh, examples of, or two more slides here with flowers. We've got pearly everlasting and ironweed for our August season. Pearly everlasting is also a host to the American lady. And both of those have leaves that are covered in a fine white down. And that's a cool thing because the American lady butterfly as a caterpillar can often be noticed and found in your garden because they'll actually use that fine hair on the leaves. They'll mix that with this silk that they secrete and they'll sew themselves into this little leafy capsule. And in doing so, they're able to hide from the predators around it. So they kind of uh, stay hidden in this capsule and eat during the night and the predators are unable to detect them. Ah, uh, let's see, ironweed is going to be host to the parthenus moth, that cool one that looks like a stained glass window. And I think that's the ironweed borer moth, so just two more great relationships that we can help. And then finally, uh, it's always important to provide a food resource into the last part of the season, and goldenrod and New England aster are two really great options. Goldenrod has so many species that use it as a host that I didn't even throw any of them up there. It's just tons and tons of species. Um, and you'll almost certainly find monarchs coming in to use the goldenrod in your yard. Uh, it's a really great food resource for them. Uh, goldenrod kind of gets a bad rap because a lot of us think, or some of us think, that we're allergic to it. But most of us, almost all of us, are not actually allergic to goldenrod. While goldenrod is in bloom, we also have ragweed in bloom. And ragweed has inconspicuous flowers. The pollen of ragweed is really light and windblown, and that's what's getting into our system and causing us to have hay fever. Goldenrod's pollen is really heavy and sticky, and it needs insects to move it around, so that's actually not getting into our systems. Uh, I always like to share that because I want to see as much goldenrod out on the landscape as possible. This one is my favorite, stiff goldenrod. I love its vibrant colors, uh, but Another great option is showy goldenrod, and I've heard that it tends to be a little bit less aggressive. It um, doesn't spread quite as much as some of the other species. New England aster, finally. Uh, it also provides that late season nectar and pollen, and it is a host to the pearly crescent butterfly. So real quick then, uh, just some shrubs and some trees to consider. Uh, three great examples here. Uh, buttonbush is one that really likes to be in a wet spot. So if you have a wet depression, or if you're next to a pond or a wetland, this is a great one to consider. This is probably the most, uh, the biggest pollinator magnet of any plant that I've ever seen. Uh, we have some of this, uh, we've got colonies of this on a couple of our Johnson County properties. One of those is at Peckman Creek Delta. So if any of you guys are kayakers, I would recommend kayaking back into a slough that is on property around the end of June, and you'll find these, and when you do, you'll see that they're vibrating with all these different pollinators that are on them. I like to lead pro uh, public programs to go visit them, and when we are able to paddle straight up to them, I'll find hundreds of bees, uh, lots of butterflies, oftentimes many different species on one single sphere of those flowers. That was really cool. American plum and serviceberry, all three of these are host plants. But also with those latter two, you'll be able to enjoy those delicious fruits and be able to feed some of the songbirds in your backyard too. And then finally here, some great trees to consider. These three different examples are at the top of the list. Uh, we've got 
any kind of oak, and collectively, oaks are able to feed 400 and, or 534 species. Uh, second on that list is any cherry species. I chose black cherry here, and I also like that they're able to provide a pollen and nectar source in the early season, feeding 456 different species. And then birch, and we've got river birch here in Johnson County, feeds 413 species. So, I hope that uh, you guys are all getting excited about what kinds of native plants you want to, to fill your spaces with. So some resources to consider uh, to learn more and get started. All five of these books are fabulous and they're all available here at the Iowa City Library. If you had to choose any one of these books, you can probably guess I'm going to steer you towards Douglas Tallamy. Uh, I would especially recommend Bringing Nature Home. So I mentioned earlier that I knew that native plants were important. I advocated for them. But it was really this book that made me uh, understand on a much deeper level why native plants are so significant to their ecosystems. So it's a quick read, an easy read, uh, and I hope will really bring it home. Since I haven't talked much about bees in this presentation, I do want to point out also that bee book by Heather Holm. Uh, she is a native of Minnesota, and so she has really great resources for us here in the Midwest. Uh, just like there are specialist insect herbivores that can only use the leaves of certain plants, there are specialist bees that only choose to pollinate certain plants too. Uh, she goes through and provides those examples and some great plants to consider. So. Another place to check out is the Pollinator Partnership website. On that, you can go to resources, type in your zip code, and download your own uh, planting guide. I actually created one for us here in Johnson County. It's this one that says why native plants matter. But further in, I actually put together a table. This is just some species, right? There's maybe 12 species of flowers, some shrubs, some trees. But in this, I laid out the host plants that these things uh, have, or the relationships that they provide and then some notes on the other wildlife benefits that they provide as well. And that's similar to this Prairie Parkland Guide. I am always using the wild, Illinois Wildflowers website. Uh, I use that professionally all the time. Some great things that has good tips on ID, but also the site preferences. So any of these species that you see, make sure that they first will fit your space and fit the conditions that you have. And you can check that here. But my very favorite thing about this website is that it goes through the faunal associations. And so this talks about what bees this plant might be particularly attractive to, or the beetles that it has a relationship with, animals that uh, are known to use that, that plant all the time. I love that it actually thinks about those relationships and devotes time and energy to it, because we don't find that very often through a lot of our resources. Okay, where to get native plants? This is actually a little bit tough. Unfortunately, it can be hard to find native plants locally. Uh, a lot of the plants that we do find in our local garden centers oftentimes are cultivars. Now cultivars probably still have the same leaf chemistry as the heirloom varieties and still could be usable for the things that use it as a host plant. But since cultivars are also bred for some of our purposes, maybe to highlight certain colors or to uh, change the way, the compactness of the plant, uh, other features like that. In the process, it may also be changing the nutrition value of the, the pollen and the nectar. So as much as possible, I would recommend sticking with the actual heirloom variety of a plant. But I'd still recommend going to your favorite garden center, maybe bring a list of the plants that you're interested in. And even if the visit doesn't result with any flowers that you can take home, I think the more that there is proven demand, the more this will eventually change, or hopefully it will change quicker than, um, than it is at the moment. But these three are some great regional companies that you can check out. Ion Exchange is out of Northeast Iowa. Uh, Prairie Moon Nursery is out of Winona, Minnesota. And then Prairie Nursery is somewhere in Wisconsin, I can't remember where. Uh, all of those are appropriate for us to use here in Johnson County. And uh, I've used all three of those personally. I like all three of them. I really like the user interface of the Prairie Moon Nursery website. I like that you can select 
for the conditions that you have. And so you can just say you're looking for a shady spot, it's wet soil, and it does the work for you. It uh, already starts to filter down to what native plants you should consider for your space. Another great thing, all three of these companies will put together pre-designed garden packs. So again, you have to do less work and uh, if you're particularly interested in drawing in hummingbirds, it's got a pre-designed pack that is especially attractive to them. Or if you don't want like a tall grass jungle in your backyard, there are mixes that stay about three feet tall. And so you can start to narrow down to the interests that you have and find things that are already put together like that. Some great places locally for native trees. Uh, Iowa City Landscaping carries a variety um, this next spot is out of Woodward, uh, which is closer to Des Moines, uh, Iowa Native Trees and Shrubs. But their list is really extensive. They've got a ton of, of different options. And then beautiful land products out of West Branch will be moving towards having native trees in the future. OK, so going with seeds or pots, I'll just talk about this real quick. Uh, seeds are obviously a cheaper option, but you're going to have more of that natural prairie look. So if that's not what you're going for, I would think about having the potted plants. Seeds also take a little bit or quite a bit longer to establish. Uh, oftentimes it can take up to five years for seeds to actually bloom for some species. Potted plants are going to be more expensive, but if you're in a, um, a neighborhood where you want to keep a nice tidy space, that could be a really great option for you. Uh, they do provide that more orderly look. And often, those potted plants are going to bloom within just one or two years. Like I mentioned in my plant profiles, be thinking about how you can fill that full growing season, providing nectar and pollen for those earliest emerging bees and butterflies, all the way into the late season when we've got the migrating uh, butterflies like monarchs and buckeye butterflies. And then I've got a few other considerations here to wrap this up. Um, these are just considerations for an eco-friendly and pollinator-friendly backyard, but also to keep you popular with the neighbors. <laughs> so one thing that I hear all the time, people that come out to the Nature Center in Kent Park and chat with me, they say that they're interested in planting more native flowers, but they're really nervous about what the neighbors are going to say. Like they uh, don't want to make anyone upset. I think that signage is a great way to, to tackle this. Uh, signs can help to signal to the people around you that you're not being lazy, you're not a negligent gardener, uh, and also can maybe inspire them and help to educate them and make them think differently about the space, the backyard spaces that we have. So I just cho chose three generic signs here. Um, there are tons of them available. This first one is just on Amazon for about $25. Uh, the second one is available through the Xerces Society, which is the leading insect conservation or uh, invertebrate conservation group in the country. I think that comes with a $55 donation. And then you can also register your garden as a monarch way station, and you can do that through Monarch Watch. Then not only are you getting a sign and helping to resolve some of those issues, but you're also helping the scientists that work with Monarch Watch to have a better picture for what resources are available to monarchs as they are migrating. And that comes with a $17, or you register your garden, pay $17 and get that sign in uh, response. Uh, another thing you can consider for a pollinator friendly space is to see if you can utilize logs in part of your design. Uh, maybe you can use them uh, as they are fully laid out as edging for a flower garden or a vegetable garden. I really like to have shorter logs that I turn on end and then use it as a platform for a flower pot. And the great thing about logs, they're providing habitat underneath of them but also, thinking about bees, they're providing habitat for the cavity nesting bees that we have out there. About 30% of our native bees will nest in cavities either in trees or in little uh, pithy stems, like we talked about with the rattlesnake master. So any logs that we have that already have woodpecker holes or beetle holes can be then recycled by native bees that will use that space as a ne uh, nesting habitat. One of my favorite things to throw out there is, here's your chance to be a lazy gardener. Uh, a lot of us are going through in October and November and tidying everything up, clearing up our garden spaces. I would say instead, just sit back, relax, leave those things over the winter. That's a time when having valuable habitat is especially important. So some of the things that leaving your flowers standing will do, if you have, again, cavity nesting bees, 
they may already be in the stems of our wildflowers. So if we are removing them and putting them in the city compost or wherever we're putting them, we could be unintentionally getting rid of some of these native bees. So instead, keep all of those flowers standing until maybe the early part of April, and then it's a good time to go through and clean everything up for the next year. Then also, by leaving your flower heads standing, you're providing free bird seed to the birds around you. I always enjoy watching flocks of juncos come to my backyard and eat the seeds from some of the flowers that I leave standing. So it's just a, a free and easy way to draw songbirds to your yard. And finally, uh, the last thing that I'm really hoping to change, the paradigm I'm hoping to shift, is how we think of leaves in our backyards. I'm a big advocate for leaving the leaves. Leaves provide really valuable habitat. A lot of things, pollinators included, will find overwintering habitat underneath them. One of those is the fritillary butterflies that I talked about. Uh, they will overwinter actually as caterpillars, and they'll find habitat space under leaves. So let's say you have a front yard or a space where there's a big blanket of leaves and you simply cannot leave them there. In that case, maybe consider whether there are other parts of your yard you can put them instead. If they can be mulching around trees, if they can go on top of our flower gardens or vegetable gardens, maybe the edges of our yards. Anywhere that we can leave some of those places standing is going to be a great overwintering habitat for our pollinators. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope that you leave here thinking about and being curious about what kinds of relationships are out there, what kinds of relationships you can help foster by deciding to, to plant native species. Uh, I'm going to close with this picture here of a Cecropia moth which uses oak trees as one of its hosts. Uh, they get to be about the size of my finger, a little bit bigger. So that'd be a really cool thing to draw into your backyard if you have those native trees. So I will, uh, I guess, turn it over and take questions in a little bit. I think. Um, I think before the question and answer period, we'll go ahead and take a break. And again, just to remind you, the cookie line goes that way, <laughs> cookie and coffee line. And we'll do that for about 20 minutes. And then uh, we'll be back for Q&A. And then that'll give you an opportunity to go ahead and write down questions on the, uh, on the board up there. And then we'll address that right after, after break. And before oh. there's a lot of movement, I just wanted to point out uh, there are native seeds yes. here, and those were donated to us by a volunteer, Connie Aldridge, who went through and sorted seeds. Oh, great, we got her right here. <laughs> oh, fabulous. Okay, yeah, so Connie actually went through and hand sorted and packed all of those for us. So you can thank Connie for bringing those to this program. Thank you. I'll just start at the top. Um, are there local regulations that prevent growing milkweed, like in Iowa City or Johnson County? I know that there are some HOAs that might have their own regulations. Uh, but in the city, I know that there are a lot of uh, advocacy to get more milkweed out there. But I guess I'll turn that to you guys, too, if any of you have run into issues like this. Does anyone have more information that they can share on those kinds of regulations? Nope. I believe that if you are not affiliated with an HOA, the city doesn't have any regulations against it, because I see it all the time. Uh, I live in the east part of Iowa City, and I'll see a lot of different houses that have planted wildflowers, and some of them are four or five foot tall, and they're right next to the sidewalk, and they're never gotten in trouble, so. <laughs> Do um, redbud and pagoda dogwood support native insects? They do, yeah. Yeah, dogwood has a bunch of different um, things that it is a host to. Uh, redbud is a great nectar and pollen tree as well. Uh, I would again turn you to those pollinator partnership, that website, and you can find a shrub section and see more of those specific uh, relationships that exist. But any native plant that you choose to plant will be a 
beneficial relationship to something. So even if it's not a huge magnet to everything, know that there is some species that is going to be affiliated with it. So you really can't go wrong. That's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> um, this person states that uh, they realize that this is primarily a meadow prairie presentation, but can you address some shady yard suggestions uh, for native plants or pollinator friendly plants? Yeah, there are a ton. Um, and if you go to any of those websites and like the Prairie Moon Nursery, Ion Exchange Prairie Nursery, you can look for specific suggestions for a shade, uh, shady yard. There are lots and lots of spring ephemerals, so those first blooming wildflowers that you could decide on. Uh, I can just throw some out. Uh, we've got like columbine, um, trout lily, spring beauty, uh, bluebell, a lot of things that you can try to propagate. Uh, there are later season options too. We have a lot of white snake root that grows in our wooded areas at Kent Park, and that blooms throughout August and into September. Uh, that isn't a huge pollinator draw, but it's still a food resource during that time. Goldenrod can exist in more shady spaces if you want to have that taller uh, herbaceous layer. Um, but yeah, I would definitely turn you to the, the real experts are the people that are growing and selling these native plants. They've done a lot of the research already, and they'd have great options for you. Are leaves in the compost okay for overwintering caterpillars and larvae, or do they need to be more spread out? And I have a kind of a secondary part of that. Um, I do like to leave my leaves in my flower beds, but I'm always worried about what the best time is then to rake them up in the spring. I, it, will I interrupt their cycle if there's a nice day in early April? And I know what you mean. Yeah, I've struggled with that too. Uh, first of all, to the leaves in the compost question, uh, that might not be the best place for those things to find habitat. Um, they might be more likely to find that leaf cover where they're already existing. So the leaves are falling onto the lawn, they're falling underneath the trees, maybe consolidating them under there if possible. But I still think that it's not a harmful thing to also add those leaves to the compost. There might be things that are kind of getting tussled up into the leaves and then they're able to have shelter in a nice insulative spot within that compost pile. So I don't think it would hurt. It might not be the most beneficial spot, but I don't think it's harmful. And then your question about the best time of year, from I've also tried to pin down this answer and from everywhere that I have read, from like the Xerces Society, other leading experts, they suggest going with something like April as your best option. If you're going to need to tidy it up anyways. Waiting until a spot that works, that's still past the winter time and it works within your schedule before you start gardening is better than getting rid of them altogether. So uh, I'm gonna go with that as, as kind of the best, what's the word I'm looking for? The best compromise, exactly, between meeting your needs and meeting the pollinator's needs. It might not be perfect, there might be still things mm -hmm. harmed, but it's better than nothing. Okay, great. Uh, is the overpopulation of deer detrimental to native plantings and are there native plants resistant to deer? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that there are spaces that are getting over browsed by deer for sure. Yeah, that can be detrimental. Um, we have a, a plot out at Kent Park where we have closed off from deer and it's just interesting to see the differences in the understory. Um, off the top of my head, I haven't personally researched any deer resistant native plants. Does anyone here feel comfortable with some that you've experienced? Uh, like you said, all those uh, native plant nurseries also have a deer resistant yeah. uh, thing. You just plug it in there. Awesome. Yeah, again, a lot of my answers will probably come to steering you to the absolute experts, and I'm sure that they have great information. Well, I can get lost on those websites forever. And to that point, someone had asked a question about planting uh, a more eco-friendly grass, and we were just chatting about those websites again, and a lot of them have resources. And so you can 
click to articles that they have put together that will tell you more about all of these different topics. So great things online. And in addition to some of the resources that you've um, already mentioned, are there some other resources to take a large grassy field to a wildflower field or prairie, starting from scratch with a large area, an acreage? Yeah, that's a, another big question. Um, it depends on what's already existing there, what has been planted in the past, if it's going from a crop field to a meadow, or if it has invasives already established there. There's going to be different answers. Uh, sometimes for large scale restorations like that, you're not going to be able to do it as well without utilizing some other necessary evils, uh, using herbicides in the process is something that you will find on these native plant guides as well. So it just depends on how big your, your space is and the, the vegetation that's already existing there. Um, if you're working with smaller spaces, you can do a, a smothering where you have a tarp down, cardboard, newspaper layers that will deprive that space of sunlight for a full growing season. Uh, sometimes it can take as little as two months if you're just working with lawn grass. But smothering that space out and then using that as a blank canvas to intercede your, your native mix into. But with larger areas, smothering probably is not going to be as realistic and you might need to look into what herbicides you can safely use. Great. This one is a, a plea for help. Um, <laughs> help me control my Japanese beetles. Do, pl uh, do yeah. plants they like make the problem worse or better? and any plants they don't like. This is a great example of a generalist because they really like to eat all kinds of things. I don't know of any, my, my particular method that I use is, um, it's kind of a satisfying way for me to take revenge on them, but I usually will visit some of my, my plants, they really love my beans. I'll visit with a bucket of soapy water and I have to do it regularly. But uh, they really love things like, they love basswood. And there's a basswood right next to my house. And so they, they have this great food source that they are particularly drawn to that they are reproducing like wilds on. Uh, I don't know of any large scale methods that are currently being deployed. Again, it looks like someone has a better suggestion. Go ahead. I put them in a milk bottle and I feed them to the neighbor's chickens. And they shut them up. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So get chickens. Yeah, get chickens. Is our answer to that? <laughs> Flying chickens. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, is there any um, product, company or product, that you can use to spray yards without hurting bees? Hmm. And I'm not sure spraying for weeds or... Oh, okay. This is something that I am not a particular expert on. Uh, we did have a, a speaker out to Kent Park, uh, this was a couple of years ago, who was both the honeybee queen of Iowa and the daughter of someone who owned one of those companies. And she talked uh, uh, some detail about this and talked about the importance of time of day when these things are being sprayed and how the time of day impacts whether or not it will affect bees. I can't remember what the particulars are of that, but I would use that as a starting point to, to learn more, something about when the bees are foraging and when those sprays are being applied. Yeah. Again, anyone else have any other expertise on that topic? And you don't remember the name of the person or the organization? No, she was a single um, individual that was traveling the, the state oh, okay. giving bee presentations. Okay. The honeybee queen. Honeybee queen. So we could maybe Google that one or something. Um, what are the issues planting native plant pollinators next to farm fields? Uh, 
with the herbicide drift, farmers who don't like weeds next to fields? Yeah, there are, I would steer you to, if you haven't grabbed one of these, go ahead and do so. Um, in this, this is um, put out by the DNR, and I was actually recently talking with our district forester, Mark Vitosh, about this. And in here, you'll see that there is a suggestion for having a buffer of native plants that are not big host plants. So if you can provide that buffer to kind of catch some of that herbicide drift mm -hmm. and prevent it from getting onto the species that you know are going to be eaten by a lot of our pollinators, that could be a really great move to make. And this goes into greater detail on that. So I'll just, um, That's great. Yeah. Okay. And here's, I'll end on a very hopeful question here. Does Creeping Charlie support insects? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I always see bees on my Creeping Charlie. Um, I usually, my own personal preference in my yard might make some people's uh, not very happy. Uh, luckily, it's all fenced in in the back. But um, I personally will let it grow while it's in bloom and just kind of I have given over some of the shady areas to it because I see a lot of bees that visit the Creeping Charlie. And in my opinion, if it's that or grass, I'd rather it be something, but that's just, just my stance on it. So it does have some beneficial purposes for the insects that are out there. Of course, a native flower would be even better to have in that space anyways. So, yeah. Okay, that's great. I think that's, uh, that's all the questions I have written down. Oh. Go ahead, sir. something that you, sorry, say that last part again. That is, again, going back to your personal preferences. If that's something that you're okay with, absolutely, that's the best of all of the options is to just leave that, have it be a leafy space that will provide habitat for all kinds of things, pollinators and otherwise. Um, the idea of cleaning them up is just for if you also want to meet your human desires for that space. If you don't want a huge leaf blanket, at least wait until that point. Uh, for those of you that are okay leaving them over the winter but do want to remove them later, simply mowing them into smaller pieces for a lighter blanket can be all that you need to do to help break them into smaller pieces. All of the decomposers that we have will then take the job on from there and help to break it down further. So, but yeah, leaving them is absolutely fine. Yeah. I wanted to share one more thing. Sure. Um, Connie Aldridge, the person who brought us all those great seed packets, also has these seed balls that she had made wow. um, that she is giving away for wow. all of you guys. So nice. There are um, several here, and they're, I believe, a lot of the same species that are found in those. So all native Iowa species that she's like growing in her property. So I'll just have these in there. Um, thank you, everybody. Okay, well, thank you, Chris. It is great. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe one more question there. What was Connie's last name again? Aldridge. Aldridge. Yep. Did she do more than she did your contact information or the other? She might be. If anyone would like to reach out to me with more questions, I unfortunately am all out of business cards and I need to print more. But if you grab one of the newsletters for Johnson County, mm -hmm. if you flip back to the calendar portion, you'll find that many of those events I am in charge of. So you'll see my email in there, just kmorrow at co.johnson.ia.us, a great government website, great government email. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you can reach out to me, and I'll see if we can get you in touch. Well, thank you, Kristen, thank very you. much. It was excellent. And before I'm, before I let you go, though, I need to uh, have you pull some names All out right. for our door prizes. We've got a few door prizes over there, um, some mugs from Project Green, some hats. Uh, a couple flashlights, and in the bag is some honey. Uh, so we're going to do that real quickly, and then we'll get to Fred right after that. So, start getting, go ahead. Okay. Pick steaks here. <laughs> Bonnie Penno. Bonnie Penno. Oh, my God. And the first person I can just choose which one of these that they want. Let's go Wait, through them in order. Larry Allen. Larry Allen. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Carol uh, 
And as I said, as our bonus round today, we had Fred Meyer from Backyard Abundance, and he's going to take a little time to tell you what uh, what his organization's all about and what they've got planned for this year. And then afterwards, if people want to come up, I guess as long as they last and get one of those seed balls, they're welcome to do it. So go ahead, Fred. Thank you. Thanks. So I won't talk for too long. Again, my name is Fred Meyer. I'm the director of Backyard Abundance. We're a local environmental education nonprofit. And we show folks how to create environmentally beneficial landscapes. And one of the ways we do that is through hands-on educational classes. And speaking of that, we've got a couple public events that I think you'll be very interested in at Creekside Park. We're establishing, we're working with Iowa City Parks and Recreation in the local neighborhood there to establish a public orchard and a pollinator garden there. So we've got two events. One on April 1st is going to establish the orchard. Love to have you there. Both events are free. And the next one is establishing a public pollinator garden. So everything that Kristen's been talking about is going to, you'll learn how to actually establish it from plants that were locally grown by beautiful land products. And the pollinator garden is designed to be an ever-blooming garden. So if you want an ever-blooming garden that doesn't get over two or three feet high, you can actually learn how to put those plants in the ground. We'll have handouts about what the species are and where you can get them. So that's it. Yeah. What was the date on that? Uh, April April 18th, and this handout is over there, but there may not be enough. It's on our website, um, backyardabundance.org, and on our Facebook page. Yeah, that's all I had to say. Yeah. Yes, Creekside Park is off of Muscatine Road. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yep.